Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. And I wanted to say uh, hello and welcome from sunny California. It is the morning here, but I know we have people joining in from all around the world. So thank you for taking some time to listen to uh, Jackson Family Wines and our sustainability journey. I'm going to jump right in and start with a slide deck just so that we can cover some of the key parts of our journey and, and hopefully you can gain something from it as you think about your winery or your uh, sustainability journey for your organization. So again, my name is Aaron Stainthorpe. I'm the sustainability manager for Jackson Family Wines and I'll walk you through just uh, some of our role in incorporating sustainability into our business operations. So to begin, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Jackson Family Wines we started in California in the early 1980s, but at this point we are a global wine brand. Um, and so some of the things that, that we really value about that is we're then able to share best practices. So when one of our wineries in Australia figures out a more water efficient way to do things, we can then share that with our wineries in Sonoma and Napa. Um, we also own most of the vineyards that we source from. So from a winemaking standpoint and also from a sustainability standpoint, that gives us a lot of control into the growing decisions and really lets us both optimize uh, how we want to practice farming and then how we want to really produce wines with that distinctive uh, taste. And then the other point that I'd want to highlight on this slide is we have been fortunate enough to really be able to uh, grow and produce wine in some premier wine regions across the world. So we're primarily focused on making wines of distinction, really wines that, that have a legacy to them. And, and that also leads into kind of our sustainability platform about building a legacy for the future. So again, just kind of an overview for Jackson Family Wines. These are some of the brands that we're really well known for. Right in the middle, you'll see Kendall Jackson. So that's really one of our flagship wines that started the company. And Kendall Jackson has produced America's number one Chardonnay for the last 25 years running. So we're very proud of that. You also see brands like uh, La Crema and Murphy Good, which you know are, are very uh, accessible to the everyday consumer. But then we have some wines that are, are more exclusive and really sought after, like uh, Cardinal, La Coya, Verite. And so we're very proud that Jackson Family Wines, we really span a very diverse portfolio of wines and, and can engage wine consumers at a lot of different price points, uh, producing excellent wine, but you know, with a different uh, focus for, for different connoisseurs and, you know, people who just want wine for, for everyday enjoyment. So with that said, just a little kind of overview of the company, I want to go back to the founder, Jess Jackson. So again, he founded the company in the early 1980s, and he had this quote that really we stuck by ever since, take care of the land and it will take care of you. And I hope that you can see as I talk about the ways that we've incorporated sustainability into our business, this ethos really undercuts everything that we do and, and serves as that pillar that we can build on. Um, we farm 13,000 acres. And so we like to think of ourselves as really a land-based company. Again, that connection to the vineyard where we own most of the grapes that we source from. And so with that, we have a lot of latitude to explore sustainability in the winery, in the vineyards, and then as we relate to consumers. So usually when we talk about sustainability, I can tell our sustainability story, but it really helps when we have the uh, credentials of a third party. So I like to say certification equals credibility. And here you can see uh, for our US wines, the primary wine sustainability certifications that we use. So California Certified Sustainable, that's that logo right up on top. That's a program that we use statewide, and I think probably the largest volume of wine we're producing is out of California. Um, we also use uh, SIP, which is Sustainability in Practice. That's more out of the California Central Coast. And then um, Oregon uh, Live Certification for our wineries up in Oregon. But I think we found that these sustainability certifications, they help us tell our message to consumers. And they're also a way that we can um, ensure that we're meeting best practice just looking at the California Certified Sustainable um, certification, there's over 200 different practices in there. And so having those certifications both is useful for a communication standpoint and then to ensure that we are, are taking a very holistic approach to our operations. And for this work, we've 
receive some recognition and awards. So on the screen, you can see uh, some of the awards that, that we're very proud of and we think help showcase our work. Um, just last year, we won Green Company of the Year from the drinks uh, business. We've also been awarded the Climate Leadership Award uh, for some of the work that I'll get a chance to talk about later. EPA Green Power Partnership, that's uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in the US. We've been awarded uh, three years in a row um, well, not three years in a row, but three years, we skipped one year um, for our work there to incorporate renewable energy into our portfolio. Wine enthusiast recognized us and the Taurus family for our work on international wineries for climate action. And then you'll see some other awards there that really uh, show our leadership um, in California in developing new technology for the wine industry with uh, environmental leader and then Brit Fibs for kind of a holistic view of sustainability in our operations. So what does that mean, right? Let's let's actually take a look at this. So on the screen right now, you can see um, just a screenshot of our 2016 responsibility report. And that was our inaugural public sustainability report. But we've been working on this since 2008. And at Jackson Family Wines, we strive to be very data and metrics driven. So when we wanted to set goals for ourselves for 2020, we wanted to make sure we could measure them. And here you can see the progress that we've made since 2008 um, in 2020. So greenhouse gas intensity, that's the amount of um, greenhouse gas emissions we're producing per bottle, that's the intensity. So we've reduced that by 24%. Water intensity, we've made great strides there and seen a 43% uh, reduction. Um, in our wineries, we've really embraced renewable energy. And so right now, 28% of the electricity in our winery is coming from renewable energy on site. Um, and then we also recognize that both our employees and the communities we operate uh, are a key part of, of, of letting us have this positive impact. And so we have a rooted for good program where employees volunteer two days a year. Um, and we have 75% or more of our staff participating in those every year. Uh, I'll mention this uh, more later, but you know, one of the things that for us is really important, in addition to having all of our state wineries and vineyards third party certified on that previous slide I mentioned, we also pay a sustainability bonus to our growers for certified fruit. And that's a way to ensure that any fruit that we're not growing ourselves is also following these best practices um, for really producing and farming uh, grapes in the best way possible. Um, and then lastly, we've had a big focus on zero waste practices within our wineries, our tasting rooms, our offices, really everywhere. And so you can see we've been able to achieve a 98% waste diversion, which means only 2% is going to the landfill, the rest is getting recycled or composted. So these are kind of the measurements that we've used. I'm gonna to touch on just kind of a few of those in greater detail, but then I wanna tell you about the future because this is where we've been. This is the part of our journey about how we're here so far, but we're also looking at what's, what's coming up on the pathway. So uh, climate change is something that none of us can ignore. And I think when we talk about our sustainability journey, this is a key part for us. So on our climate change journey, um, we've been able, on the last slide I talked about intensity. So the amount of greenhouse gases we've reduced per bottle, but we're increasingly focusing on our absolute emissions. So that's the total emissions we produce as a company. And for that, we've been able to reduce our absolute emissions uh, 17.5% since 2015. Um, so we are taking uh, really big steps to leave a small footprint. And the way that we've done this is by strategically focusing on emissions hotspots and then implementing strategies to reduce those emissions. So some of the, the key areas that we focused on historically to get to this point are lightweighting our glass bottles, incorporating renewable energy, implementing zero waste practices, focusing on energy efficiency in our wineries and operations, and then also looking at transportation and vehicle efficiency. Uh, I know I've already highlighted this, but um, in 2014, we were able to take the uh, savings that we've achieved from energy efficiency and invest them in renewable energy. And with that, we built the largest solar portfolio in the US wine industry at 7.1 megawatts combined with 4.2 megawatts of uh, on-site battery storage. 
And we were lucky enough to actually be one of the test rollout locations for Tesla when they um, wanted to test having stationary batteries at, at wineries. And so we have those at six different wineries. And we have solar panels at 11 of our wineries, which collectively is 20,000 uh, solar panels. So that on an annual basis produces enough power for over 1,100 homes. Um, and I think it has been great for us from a sustainability perspective. It's also been great from a business perspective to the point that we are continuing to double down on renewable energy. Um, and we're working towards adding more with hopefully uh, two or three new projects coming online later this year. So this is an area that we've tried to, to go pretty strong. And it's also how we've received recognition from the EPA with their Green Power Partnership Award. On the waterfront, um, for those of you who are not um, in California or in the US, right now California is going through yet another historical drought. And so necessity is the mother of invention. We've needed to focus on how to reduce our water use as much as possible and how to integrate uh, new technologies and also different practices to save water. So you can see those efforts have paid off for us where we've been able to save 29 million gallons of water per year and compared to our 2008 baseline, we've seen a 43% in water intensity. So the way we've done that is a combination of practices. One, again, we try to be very data driven. So we've done very detailed analysis with water audits, true cost of water to determine the cost of water at each facility, and then installing uh, real time water meters with automatic leak alerts at our wineries. We've then taken that and given that information to staff so they're empowered to understand where their water use is occurring, what the water use hotspots are. And with that true cost of water, they're able to then help uh, work with us to determine uh, water conservation and efficiency efforts that are gonna have the greatest ROI. So some of the technology that's come out of that process, uh, right here on screen, you can see our Blue Morph waterless uh, sanitation uh, device. And so this is, um, I love to tell this story because we had um, uh, the, the, somebody show up at our doorstep with what looked like a lightsaber from Star Wars. And they said, hey, I can sanitize tanks with a UV light. And we partnered with them and worked with them for really a number of years to develop this product that you can see right here. So the, this is the Blue Morph UV light sterilization unit. And um, Blue Morph was able to take this technology and develop it from a lightsaber into something that can actually slide in a tank, fold up, and then we have it programmed for our tanks and our wineries. And so we'll say, okay, based on a 10,000 gallon tank, it's gonna need 15 minutes to sterilize. And we didn't wanna, you know, take that and not have that be available. So we've really helped grow, grow Blue Morph. So now they actually provide this technology to uh, wineries um, everywhere. So more and more wineries can engage with this. Uh, similarly, because we are so invested in barrels, we have about 100,000 barrels in our operation. We've developed technology um, that's helped cut our barrel washing use by 60 to 70%. And it uses essentially as barrels go through the cleaning process, it can take water, um, the dirtiest water, and use it to pre-rinse uh, barrels coming into that process. So we still get very clean barrels that let us produce kind of the wines that we're known for, but we can do it while using 60 to 70% less water. Um, that has been great for saving water. It's also been a great business decision as we're using less water and using less heat to heat up that water. Um, we've also had innovations in uh, how we operate our cooling towers, which are major sources of water use. And then we've really embraced rainwater capture because in California, the rain we do get is really concentrated in the winter. So by then capturing rainwater and storing it in our open top fermenta fermentation tanks that are not being used, we're actually able to kind of bank some of that water um, and then use it uh, later in the year for non-wine applications like cooling towers and, and cleaning. Um, and speaking of that, I also wanted to highlight we really see our water use as being kind of part of this larger ecosystem and us being watershed stewards. And so again, in California, since most of our rain is falling in the winter, we've actually been able to think about the role that our, our vineyards and our land can play in helping improve ecosystems. So the picture that you're seeing here is a vineyard that we've actually intentionally flooded. This is part of our groundwater recharge. And when we get this surge of rain, we can redirect that into the vineyard and have it slowly percolate into the ground. 
that's good because it actually increases the groundwater availability for the vineyard. And it also lets water slowly percolate into uh, rivers, which is much better than having a rapid flush of water into the vineyards, which is not really good for the riparian habitat or uh, the aquatic species there. So this is kind of an area we're continuing to develop where we can think about how our wineries um, really can help enhance uh, the ecosystems that they're a part of. Uh, and I'm going to touch on a few more things and I'll make sure to answer questions at the end. So please keep putting your chat, your questions in the chat, but I will get to questions at the end. Um, so another piece that I want to talk about that we're currently doing before I talk about our future efforts is uh, healthy soils and carbon farming, or increasingly we're calling this our regenerative farming practices. So this is actually at the very same vineyard that I just showed you. It's our Sarah Lee's Vineyard in Sonoma County. Um, here, we're actually doing a five-year trial on a 22-acre block to look at how we can sequester more carbon in our soils. Um, so this, I think, is incredibly exciting because typically when we talk about climate change, we can talk about reducing emissions, but talking about sequestering carbon in the soil, that really is going to be needed at some point. And I think it, it's amazing that our working lands, that these vines that are producing amazing grapes for us can actually be part of the climate solution, where just by practicing photosynthesis, if we give them the right conditions, they can store more carbon in the soil. So over this five-year trial, this is a grant funded from um, the California, uh, the Healthy Soils Program. We have academic partners, we have resource conservation partners. They're going out and actually measuring water infiltration, the soil carbon content, really the health of the soil. We're also looking at the health of the vine, the berry quality, and ultimately what this does to wine quality. So I think this is really going to be a fascinating area where we may be able to use our working lands, our vineyards as a key part of climate solutions uh, moving forward. So that's a little bit of the historical context. I'm going to just give a really brief overview of, of what I think where we're headed in the future that I think will hopefully help uh, those of you who are watching this get excited and also figure out where you might be able to join us in this effort. So Moving forward, when we think about the next 10 years, getting to 2030, we plan to focus on these four pillars, social impact, land use, water, and climate. And just to make sure we don't run out of time, I'm gonna keep moving, but uh, please, you know, these are places where um, we are always looking to collaborate with others to Im increase our impact. So to start with where we're going, I, I wanna just give people a snapshot of what our greenhouse gas emissions look like as a company. And I think for people that have not done a greenhouse gas inventory, this will probably be a really helpful primer to get a sense of what this landscape looks like. So in this donut chart, if you're not very familiar with greenhouse gas accounting, I'd start with the very center circle. So the very center circle, um, green says scope one, those are emissions that we produce on site. So think about diesel generators, uh, trucks, cars, any natural gas that's being burned for heat. Those are emissions where they're produced, on our sites or our owned infrastructure. The very small slice in blue, that's scope two emissions. So that's produced from the electricity that we buy. So anything that's sent to us uh, via power plant, via electrical distribution, there's emissions associated with it, but it's not happening on our site. And scope three, which is yellow, it's easiest to think about those as supply chain emissions. So those are emissions from things that we don't directly control but we influence through our buying habits or our business decisions. So once you see this, you can then look out at the second and third rings of that donut chart, and you can start to see some pretty clear hotspots right away. So one of the things that emerges is glass at 18% is a pretty significant part of our emissions. And so we now have efforts just focused on what we can do to reduce the carbon footprint of our packaging. You also see that uh, distribution of our wine to customers, that's also a significant chunk. And actually, if you take the distribution transportation at 15% and then combine it with the other transportation or related emissions for our own vehicles on the other side, you get up to about 40%. And so just going through this exercise, we're now able to come up with strategies to specifically target reducing emissions in key areas. And I think this is gonna be a takeaway that a lot of organizations and wineries can benefit from um, as we both first baseline what uh, emissions are currently being produced and then figure out how to decarbonize. 
And that leads us to kind of our future focus. So um, at Jackson Family Wines, we are committed to reducing our emissions 50% by 2030 and becoming climate positive by 2050. And you can see here on this graph, we've already made some pretty uh, great progress. As I said before, we've re reduced our emissions 17.5% from 2015. And we're then aiming uh, first for that 50% reduction in 2030, and then later for that um, becoming climate positive by, by 2050. And I'll note, we are aiming to do this without any carbon offset. So we are planning on reducing emissions in our own operations and then leveraging nature-based solutions in our natural working lands. But I think as ambitious as this sounds and as excited as we are about this, we also realize that if we do this alone, it won't nearly have the impact as if we do this together. And that's why in 2019, Jackson Family Wines and Familia Torres in Spain joined up to co-found International Wineries for Climate Action. And this is a place where for anyone listening, this is where we would recommend you consider getting involved. So the mission of International Wineries for Climate Action is to really uh, accelerate the voice for taking climate action. We want to uh, model best practices so people throughout the wine industry really understand our role in um, producing emissions and then really identify solutions to taking action. So for any member that joins, we are focused on becoming net zero in scopes one through three by 2050 or earlier. And there's some other great um, details about what IWCA is doing and member commitments, but this is really a very powerful platform for us all to join forces and think about how we can first gauge our own emissions and then secondly, how we can be a voice for change. Um, so if you haven't, please check out the IWCA booth in the Virtual Wine and Spirits Fair. Uh, you can find out more information there. You can also go to um, iwcawine.org, but we'd love to get more people involved in this. Um, and this was the winner of the Wine Enthusiast Wine Star Awards for really taking um, action to benefit society. And so here you can see, uh, these are um, some of the, uh, it's Jackson Family Wines and, and Taurus are the co-founders, some of the current members. Uh, we have a lot of excitement about new members that have joined that we're not ready to publicize yet. So uh, this is the coalition that's starting. We are growing rapidly and we'd love to have more people join our ranks. So again, please reach out or go to the IWCA booth to learn more. But this is a way we can collectively have um, a bigger voice and think about um, ways that we can impact uh, climate policy and climate action on a, on a national scale. And and then really walk the talk to actually make sure that we're sharing best practices across the industry about how we can um, improve our environmental footprint. Um, so then I just wanna kind of take that work that IWCA is, is leading and really make sure to draw the connections. International Wineries for Climate Action is uh, affiliated with the UN Race to Zero campaign. And the UN Race to Zero is a UN effort to really encourage businesses and organizations to hit that net zero target, right? So all wineries that are part of IWCA get to uh, participate in the UN Race to Zero and um, IWCA is uh, making sure that all of our targets are aligned with uh, science-based targets. So that's taking um, all of the science behind uh, the, the Paris Accords um, and the climate agreements that were established for countries and then breaking that down to a company level so we can all take responsibility and ensure that our, our decarbonization strategy is aligned with the latest science. So it, it's very powerful because here we've created on our sustainability journey, a tool so that everyone can collectively move towards uh, climate solutions um, together. So that's just a, a brief snapshot. There's a, a ton I didn't get a chance to cover, but hopefully that, that covers some of the things I'm excited about. Um, I'm gonna take a look at some of the questions that have come in and um, make sure to answer those questions. If uh, you have any questions for me, please feel free to reach out and you can also go to the IWCA booth, but let's take a look at some of the questions um, that have come in. So one of the first questions that I see is, uh, what have you learned from Middle Eastern wineries about viticulture on tiny water impacts? For example, Israel's application of sensor technology to irrigation. 
uh, Middle Eastern wineries and viticulture with water impact. What we've done in, in our vineyards is really use the latest technology. So I think some of those that you're probably familiar, soil moisture probes, weather station, we've also done a lot of NDVI imaging so we can actually see the vigor and then try to figure out um, where we should target. I think sap flow monitoring has also been something that has been um, really powerful for us. So just by looking at the actual stress of the vine, we can then try to target where we want to water. But we're increasingly trying to focus on ways to um, go beyond that. And so we're trialing new technology, both with, with plant sensors. We're also working, one of the things that we've been able to do that this might not be applicable everywhere, but we've uh, tried to look at where we can use alternative sources of water. So recycled water, we've tried to look at where we can actually use reservoirs to then capture that water during the rainy times. So we're trying to take a holistic look at how um, we can focus on reducing our water impact in the vineyards. And this is going to continue to be an area of focus for us. And so we'll see what works and what doesn't work. We've had some big successes. We've also had some things we've tried that have not worked. You know, one takeaway that we got from Australia was um, burying drip lines underground. And while that worked really well in Australia, as soon as we tried that uh, here in Sonoma County, we had gophers chew right through that underground uh, drip wire. So a lot of this is a learning curve as we figure this out. But one of the things that I'd say is great about IWCA, while climate is the main focus, it is a repository for sharing best practices around the world. And I think increasingly more and more people are going to be focused on water stress. So if there's learnings coming out of Israel, we would love to grab those and then figure out what can we do to be more water efficient. Um, the other question that I'm seeing is, uh, oh, <laughs> this is about our emission reduction. It's saying this is the most con constant gradient that I've seen. Uh, isn't a emission, emission reduction a lumpy process? And I think what that's implying is that graph that I showed is a nice gentle slope down. Um, so just to be clear, that graph is our emissions reduction strategy, right? And it, it does show that 17.5% that we've already reduced. But the actual practice is, yes, it is. I, I, I don't usually use the term lumpy, but yeah, it's, it's when you implement processes that when you see the emissions reduction go down. But I think for all of this, we need to have, same as we have a financial forecast for our sales next year, we need to have that goal of where we're going. And so that then lets us say, okay, we want to reduce our emissions on average 4.2% per year. And then we can, we can plan accordingly. But the actual emissions reductions, yes, are a little choppier and and don't reflect that that curve. But we all need to be thinking about what that curve is and how we can incorporate in that into how we want to do business because climate change is really a team sport. And if we don't all win, um, I don't want to think about what the future looks like. So I hope you can join uh, all of us in really learning from our sustainability journey, figuring out how that works with your sustainability efforts internally and we can help create a brighter future where there's always going to be delicious wine. So with that, I think I'm at time. I want to thank you all for joining in and attending and uh, really appreciate the questions. And please reach out either directly to me or go to the IWCA booth uh, at the Virtual Wine and Spirits uh, Pavilion. Great. Uh, thank you all very much. Mm -hmm.